It's um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Joe, be quiet. Okay, Joe, Lazama, be quiet. Beata, shut up. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mario Stevenson from the University of Miami. Dr. Stevenson is globally famous for his research in HIV. He has several unique insights into its pathogenesis, and his goal is the eventual cure of what is clearly the worst pandemic the world has ever known. We think of the great influenza, we think of <clears throat> currently of corona, but they pale uh, in significance to what, how HIV has disrupted the world. Uh, as one of the leading investigators in that area, we can't wait to hear what Dr. Stevenson has to stay, say. Uh, we've known each other a while. He called me an old friend, but I think he meant old. <laughs> Mario? Thank you, John. Got the microphone here. Yeah. Well, thank you, John, for the invitation and, and for the hospitality. And uh, Dr. Simbunwit um, showed me around Tampa yesterday. Um, and I was, you know, really surprised at how beautiful the, the city is. Um, so I, I'm, I'm enjoying my visit so far, and, and hopefully you're enjoying my visit after my talk. Um, so I'm going to discuss a topic that's close, dear to my heart, uh, something that I think is probably one of the most active areas of AIDS research. And I think in terms of infectious diseases, the quest for a vaccine or the quest for a cure for the infection are amongst the most scientifically challenging problems facing infectious disease researchers at the current time, especially at a time when we're trying to deal with a pandemic um, that's being fought on two fronts, on the HIV front and on the SARS-CoV-2 front. <clears throat> and of course, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has overshadowed and in some ways complicated our efforts to control HIV and manage the pandemic. <clears throat> I'm going to overview next slide. Okay, so I'm going to overview um, briefly the rationale for developing a cure for HIV infection. <clears throat> Dis discuss some of the some of the large programs that have centered on um, supporting research leading to a cure for HIV. Overview some of the obstacles, uh, and then discuss some of the approaches that are currently being explored to achieve a cure. So some of the work that I'm going to present from my lab is published, some of it is unpublished, and some of it I just made up. So rationale for a cure, major cure initiatives, uh, mostly occurring in the US, obstacles to curing HIV infection, overview of strategies to achieve viral eradication, and I have no disclosures. <laughs> Can we have the lights down maybe a little bit at the front? Jennifer, possible turn the lights down a little bit at the front? I think it was that. Thank you. Steve Deeks um, had in me this slide that, you know, from, from, from the individual perspective, someone living with HIV infection, sums up the rationale behind pursuing a cure for HIV infection. Of course, there's a stigma, but there's also the legal implications of living with HIV uh, from an insurance standpoint, from a healthcare management standpoint, uh, disenfranchisement from family members and friends. And for this reason, um, the number one uh, sort of driver for cure is the removing the stigma 
of HIV infection. <clears throat> and the pursuit of a cure has received significant funding support from, from the NIH, from organisations that are um, strongly being advocated by the community and are providing most of the driver for um, cure research. <clears throat> so we have the, uh, the Frontiers initiative that's being um, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this initiative basically centers heavily on gene therapy, therapy approaches to curing HIV. There are two arms to the program. One is focused on gene therapy for malignancies and the other for HIV. And the hope is that these two parallel tracks will cross fertilize each other, that lessons learned from, from obstacles to, to gene therapy for, for cancer can be, can be um, leveraged for um, gene therapy for, for HIV cure and vice versa. And this is a you know, heavily funded initiative. Um, there's, there was 100 million pledged in the first year, 200 million pledged in the second year. And then there is the NIH. In addition to RFAs asking for RO1s to look for obstacles to cure, uh, strategies for cure, there's the Martin Delaney Collaboratory for HIV Research. It's now in its, I think it's 11th year. Martin Delaney um, passed two years ago, was a powerful community advocate for AIDS research, for the rational approach to identifying why HIV is so difficult to eliminate and then advocating for research to identify a cure. And these Martin Delaney collaboratories were funded last year. There's 10 groups that have been funded across the country and taking various strategies, including broadly neutralizing antibodies, um, uh, gene therapy, cell mediated uh, approaches to HIV cure. And I'm going to overview some of these strategies. And this program uh, is, a, is a $100 million initiative um, in, the, in the first year. So over the, the five years of the program, we'll, we'll spend upwards of $300 million to advance the um, development of a strategy for HIV cure. <clears throat> and then there's American Foundation for AIDS Research in the bottom here that has pledged $50 million over five years uh, to support investigator-initiated research. They also support a cure institute at the University of California in San Francisco, headed by Paul Volberding and Steve Deeks. <clears throat> And the, the poster child for the AMFAR initiative is Timothy Ray Brown here, who was the first person cured of HIV infection. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, passed last year, was a tremendous advocate for cure research, and was also, um, he provided an example of, of what a cure should look like um, uh, in terms of the the, the, the outcome of the, the, the approach. So what are the obstacles to curing HIV and how does the virus persist in the face of this, in the face of overwhelming antiretroviral suppression? The, the pharmaceutical industry has delivered some incredible antivirals, the most potent antivirals known to science that target different stages in the viral replication cycle. But unfortunately, Despite years of, of complete antiviral suppression, if the individual stops taking the meds, there's an almost immediate rebound in plasma viremia. And I think that that's best exemplified by what's known as the Mississippi baby. The Mississippi baby was born to an HIV positive mother who had not received antiretroviral treatment during pregnancy. The infant was treated from 30 hours after birth, but the parents stopped therapy after 18 months. The infant remained off the drugs for the next 27 months, yet the virus remained undetectable in blood until the, rebound, the virus rebounded two months shy of the infant's fourth birthday. So this is a very sobering case of, um, that, that exemplifies just because we can't detect the virus doesn't mean the virus is not there. 
And this was a case that was um, uh, put together by Debbie Persaud at Hopkins, <clears throat> who's been a champion of, of the management of pediatric HIV infection. And she leads one of the Delaney collaboratories focused on uh, a cure for pediatric HIV infection. So the most, there's a general consensus that most uh, of HIV, ability of HIV to persist in infected individuals on antiretroviral therapy is due to the existence of latently infected cells. Cells harboring the viral genome in an in inert, in, in a non-active form. So here is a cell, a latently infected cell, that contains the viral genome, what we call the provirus, that's integrated into the chromosome of the host cell. And on the right hand side, we have a cell in which the virus is active. The virus is producing subgenomic viral RNAs, viral proteins that are being assembled into new viral particles that then go on to leave the cell and infect another cell. Now, the main difference between the two, of course, is that the virus, the cell on the right has a lot of viral bits and pieces, viral proteins, viral RNAs, so it can be recognized by the immune system as being infected. But the cell on the right, according to models of HIV latency, looks exactly like an uninfected cell. The only difference between the two is that the latently infected cell has a copy of the viral genome, an uninfected cell doesn't. And there's the challenge in terms of eliminating those cells. If we're hoping that the immune system can be energized to recognize a cell that's infected, if that cell is latent, there's nothing for the immune system to fixate on. So a lot of the effort in HIV cure has been to come up with ways to reactivate the latent infection, to get the virus out of latent latency so that it can then be targeted by the immune system. <clears throat> And this is considered the single biggest obstacle to the cure of HIV infection. And most of the work that's been done here was pioneered in early, uh, uh, early years of HIV infection by Doug Richmond on the left, Tony Fauci in the middle, and Bob Silicano on the right-hand side. And models of HIV latency have been refined over the years, but still, I think there's a limited understanding of, of what latency looks like in an infected individual and particularly in anatomic sites of infection. But because of the existence of these latently infected cells and the nature of the cell that harbors a latency, a CD4 T cell, a memory CD4 T cell, this is the cell that gives your immune system immunologic memory, meaning the ability of cells to respond to antigens that may have been encountered in childhood. And uh, uh, from transplant models, these memory CD4 T cells live for decades. So here you have the scenario, a virus that has a predilection for a cell type that has a lifespan measured in decades. And that lifespan of the host cell confers upon the virus that's integrated into that cell a similar longevity. So these cells are considered to give the virus lifelong persistence. And it's been estimated that it would take 70 years of continual suppressive antiretroviral therapy for these reservoirs to decay, decay, decay to zero. And obviously, that's not an end game. We can't be you know, treating people for life in the hope that eventually they'll cure the HIV infection. So efforts are in play to accelerate the process of viral reservoir decay and elimination. And then another manifestation of this latent infection is the phenomenon of homeostatic proliferation. So here is your latently infected T cell at the above on the left. <clears throat> and what happens when a memory CD4 T cell divides? T cells divide in the, in, in the normal process of immune maintenance. Some daughter cells will go on to, to retain the memory for a particular type of antigen and others will, will die. But if the, if the parent cell has an integrated copy of HIV, what's going to happen when that cell goes through mitosis? Each daughter cell is going to carry a copy of the virus too. And this continues over and over where you have daughter cells proliferating and duplicating the viral genome. And that 
for many of us is going to be an extremely tough nut to crack because we're talking about you know a fundamental process in immune maintenance that the virus has capitalized on to expand itself under antiretroviral therapy and the additional complication to this phenomenon is that sometimes the virus integrates close to a gene that's involved in cell growth regulation. And because the virus has transcriptional elements in its, in its promoter, if it integrates close to one of these cellular genes that are normally tightly regulated, then it turns on those cellular genes so that they, they act, they, 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 they have a, uh, an inc a augmented effect on cell proliferation. In other words, some cells proliferate faster because they contain a viral genome that's turning them on, making them divide faster. Some individuals, um, there's evidence that almost one third of their total viral population arose from a single integration event next to a cell growth gene that stimulated that cell. And now that cell is speeded up and dominates the, the cellular population. Now also think of the scenario if it's a memory cell that's responding to common antigens, CMV. Individuals with CMV reactivation, where their CMV specific CD4 T cells divide during a, a CMV reactivation. There's another scenario where those CMV specific CD4 T cells are going to duplicate faster during the CMV reactivation and going to expand the HIV reservoir. So this makes the challenge of removing these reservoirs um, formidable indeed. Mary Kearney here at the National Cancer Institute has done a lot of the work to show that these um, duplicated proviruses are biologically competent and that they can, during cell proliferation, be stimulated to make virus that populates rebounding viremia. Now, most of the studies that have been done on viral reservoirs on viral latency have been done on peripheral CD4 T cells, the cells that, that circulate, circulate that can be harvested for research studies from a blood draw. But the reality is that most of the virus doesn't exist in the peripheral blood, it exists in anatomic sites in the tissues. So there has been a, a dearth of insight into what's happening in those anatomic reservoirs that are hard to access, especially in living subjects, for example, the CNS. So there are areas of the anatomy that are, are still unknown to, to, to researchers in terms of what the, the virus might be doing there and what the, the cells harboring the virus might look like. <clears throat> so for that reason, a number of investigators um, including my own lab, have started to turn to treatment interruptions to try and inform on the nature of the reservoirs that exist in anatomic sites. <clears throat> and the idea is simple. Um, you have individuals who are on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, some who may have been acutely infected and have been on antiretroviral therapy shortly after they first became infected versus others who have been, who were treated um, years after first becoming infected. <clears throat> And then those individuals volunteer to do a treatment interruption. It's, it's fully legitimate uh, pro, uh, procedure with the IRB, provided you have in place protocols to make sure that as soon as the individual becomes viremic, that you can reinitiate antiretroviral therapy. There's been some discussions that perhaps by interrupting the therapy, you are reseeding the virus reservoirs the virus that comes out of, of, of those reservoirs during the treatment interruption is simply going on to inform new reservoirs. And those concerns remain. And that's why these protocols have to be very tight and ensure that we can re reinitiate the suppression once the virus becomes detectable. But what it's allowing us to do is basically look at the source, the origins of the virus. Because the virus that comes out that rebounds when someone stops treatment theoretically reflects. The, the, the nature of the cells that that virus came from. And if we assume that the virus in the blood is reflective of virus coming from various anatomic sites, then it's a non-invasive way to get insight into what's happening in the tissues. 
So Michelle Nussensweigen uh, and colleagues in New York <clears throat> compared the rebounding virus that emerged when someone, when, when, when the patient stopped the therapy with what was in the blood, what was in the circulation at that same time. And what they found was a disconnect. The virus that was rebounding in these individuals was genetically different to the virus that was in the circulating CD4 T cells, suggesting that some of the virus that's rebounding is coming from anatomic sites that are unique and have a different sort of genetic makeup to the, what everyone is usually sampling from peripheral blood. So taking that question one step further, Shaina Hendricks, a PhD student in my lab, uh, was able to access uh, um, the Ersi Kaisha cohort. These are collaborators we have in Barcelona. And what they, have, they had previously done was asked whether repeated treatment interruptions could be a, a treatment sparing. Obviously, one pill a day places a, you know, an undue burden on the individual living with HIV. There's a lot of um, uh, um, uh, fallout. So treatment adherence is a, is, is a big issue. So they thought that maybe they could mitigate some of the problems of one pill a day by just doing intermittent pulses of therapy. It turned out to be a disaster because the, those individuals simply accumulated drug resistance mutations at each treatment interruption and actually accelerated CD4 decline. So that originally was called the SMART trial. It turned out to, to be not so, so smart, but those samples are still there. And so these are individuals who have gone through two, three, four, five, six treatment interruptions. So what Shaina did was take the virus at each of these little peaks of viral rebound and compared it with what was in the, the CD4 T cells at that, that interval. And you know, obviously it's impossible to, to, to figure out what these, these uh, deep sequencing plots are meaning, but the upshot is that the virus that rebounds at each of these little intervals is different to what's in the in the CD4 T cells. And in fact, the virus that rebounds at each of these peaks is different to the virus that rebounded at the predecessor peak. So the reservoirs appear to be dynamic. They appear to be populated by viruses that we don't see in peripheral CD4 T cells. So what might those cells look like? So if we go back to this, this question, we have our individuals on suppressive therapy, they stop the treatment, the virus rebounds. What might be the types of cells that that virus came from? The virus that's not in the peripheral blood, that's in some an anatomic site that's only visualized when you stop the treatment. <clears throat> so there are two cell types that we have to worry about. Most of the attention is focused on the CD4 T cell. That's the predominant cell that's infected with HIV. But a number of, of labs have been working on the, 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 the supposition that HIV might also establish reservoirs in myeloid cells, macrophages in the CNS, in the liver, the lung, the spleen, the reticular endothelial system. But showing that has been incredibly difficult because again, doing um, reservoir studies in living subjects is challenging because of the limitations of sampling some of these sites in living subjects. And post-mortem tissue is very unreliable for reservoir analysis. So one of the characteristics that distinguishes viruses that will infect T cells from viruses that infect macrophages is, is their affinity for CD4. So the, 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 the pathway that, that to entering a cell is identical in, in macrophages and T cells, <clears throat> but macrophages have much lower densities of the primary receptor CD4 on the cell surface. They have about 20 fold lower density of CD4 compared to CD4 T cells. As a consequence, to be able to infect a macrophage, HIV has to gain a high degree of affinity for that receptor. So if you take viruses that have originated from macrophages, their envelopes the part that attaches to the receptor has a much higher affinity compared to a virus that originated from a T cell. So we can exploit that difference to, act, to determine the cellular origin of a virus that's in the blood. 
whether it came from a T cell or from a macrophage. So, um, uh, Viviani Machado, uh, a very talented PhD student who's now um, left the lab to work on SARS-CoV-2 vaccines at Inovio, um, took this phenomenon and asked, she interrogated virus from different individuals who had interrupted therapy and asked, do any of these viruses that rebound during treatment interruption come from a sort of a myeloid source? Do those envelopes have this characteristic of having a high CD4 affinity? And what she found, as expected, most of the viruses in each in the plasma of each of these individuals is T cell tropic. It has a low um, CD4 affinity. But about 5% of the viruses in each individual had a high affinity for CD4. And these are the little blips. So each of these dots is an individual viral clone. It's a virus that Viviani has obtained by single genome amplification. She's taken those envelopes and reconstructed a full length virus. So this, this slide is about two years work. And then she phenotypes each of these viruses by measuring their affinity for the viral envelope. <clears throat> And so what she was able to show is that some of these viruses do appear to have that characteristic, one that originated from a myeloid cell. And as controls on the right, for example, with this assay, if you have viruses that are made in T cells, they have low CD4 affinity, they would score here on the right at a low level of affinity. Viruses that are derived from macrophages, these are lab controls, have a high degree of CD4 affinity. But that doesn't prove that that virus came from a myeloid cell somewhere in the body. It only suggests that the virus has a high degree of affinity for CD4. But most, most of the critics in the field would say, but Mario, you know, the virus evolves all the time. It's probably evolving its envelope gene um, to evade antiviral immunity, to evade, to evade CD8 T cells, to evade antibody. So, you're going to find that some of these envelopes have different affinities for CD4. It's just a part of virus evolution. So what Viviani did was a kind of a neat experiment that again hinges on the, the biological, the, 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 the replication cycle of a virus like HIV. So here is on the, 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 this top left are, is a cartoon that shows what happens when viruses assemble at the cell surface. So the virus sends all of its ingredients for the progeny variants to the membrane, the envelopes, the structural gag polyproteins, the viral RNA to be packaged in progeny viruses. Then as the virus, as those nascent variants detach from the surface of the infected cell, they take some of the plasma membrane with it because the plasma membrane of the virus is actually derived from the plasma membrane of the cell. So in theory, if a virus evolved, was, was built in a macrophage, some of, the, some of the, the, the proteins that are specific to macrophages should be enclosed in the virus membrane. And concomitantly, if the virus assembled on a CD4 T cell, some of the viral proteins should be CD4 T cell specific. So Viviani developed what we call liganded immunocapture, you take antibodies to a, to a protein that's only expressed on macrophages versus one that's only expressed on T cells. And you use those antibodies to isolate the immunoaffinity purify virus particles from plasma of individuals who interrupt the therapy and see what happens. And the upshot is that if you, she used an antibody to a marker that's specific for macrophages, CD14, cluster de designation 14, what she was able to selectively enrich for was viruses that had that characteristic we were looking for, this high CD4 affinity. In contrast, if she used a T cell specific marker, in this case CD3, the viruses that she pulled out of plasma from infected individuals had a very low affinity for CD4. Exactly what you would expect if some viruses in plasma were actually had a myeloid cell origin. And just to further drive home the message, she then was able to show that those viruses that she captured with myeloid-specific antibodies were able to replicate efficiently 
in macrophages. So analysis of rebound viremia points to several potential anatomic sites and sources of rebound viremia and indicates that there is another reservoir, a myeloid cell reservoir, where it's located, we don't know. This is agnostic in terms of whether these be CNS macrophages or alveolar macrophages in the lung or cut for cells in the liver um, or splenic macrophages. <clears throat> All it's telling us is that in individuals on suppressive therapy, the virus is hiding in, in myeloid cells in some anatomic compartments. And those reservoirs are likely going to require unique approaches to promote their elimination. Because most of the attention right now in the field is really focused on strategies to get rid of infected memory CD4 T cells that are unlikely to work with this type of reservoir. So let me switch gears now to what are the viable strategies by which we might achieve a remission or a cure. And I want to just qualify what we mean by a cure in the HIV field right now. There are two types of cure. If you, if you hear someone talking about their cure research, some few are working on what's called a sterilizing cure on the left. And a sterilizing cure is one that's it's aiming to achieve the complete elimination of all vestiges of the virus, all the viral genomes, all the infected reservoir cells from that individual. And I think arguably we may have one or two cases of a sterilizing cure. But that is going to be a tall order to get at a sterilizing cure that removes all vestiges of the virus. So most of the work that's being done in the field is focused on the right hand side, which is a functional cure. And there are examples of functional cure. There is the um, uh, the French cohort um, that showed that individuals who started treatment early, not too early, but individuals who started treatment early and were maintained on therapy for several years and stopped their therapy were able to control the virus after the virus, after the therapy was stopped. Those are examples of functional cure. The virus is there, but somehow starting treatment early kept the reservoir size small and allowed the immune system now to take over and control viral reservoir expansion. Now, the problem with the functional cure is that individuals who have shown evidence of functional cure still have some of the comorbidities associated with pathogenic HIV infection. They have inflammation, they have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's not an ideal situation, but from, from a feasibility standpoint, it seems to be the most practical um, uh, uh, task facing us at, time, at this time. So I'm going to start with gene and cell-based therapies. The poster child for gene and cell-based therapies are Timothy Ray Brown, also known as the Berlin patient, <clears throat> uh, uh, originally from San Francisco, uh, was living in Berlin with HIV infection when he was diagnosed with, with lymphoma. The standard of care was a bone marrow transplant. So Timothy had two rounds of bone marrow transplantation. But his physician, Gerard Hooter, noticed some papers uh, from researchers in the US showing that individuals with a genetic, a 32 base pair deletion in their CCR5 locus were resistant to HIV infection. CCR5 is a co-receptor for HIV and about one in 100 Caucasians have a, uh, a homozygous 32 base pair deletion that knocks out their CCR5 gene and those individuals resist infection. And that was revealed by studying discordant couples where you had one HIV infected individual in a long term relationship with an HIV uninfected individual. And in some of these couples, the HIV, um, the, the uninfected individual remained uninfected despite repeated exposure to HIV. And after genetic analysis found that those individuals who were resistant carried this genetic mutation. So what Gerard Hurer did is transplanted Timothy Brown with bone marrow from an individual who was HLA matched and had the CCR5 deletion. And Timothy, who passed last year, um, um, basically was cured of his infection. So all vestiges of the virus were gone. Um, poor Timothy was poked, bled, um, uh, surgically incised to, 
um, by individuals who were trying to find traces of the virus and oil oil field. And in addition, the antibody to the virus eventually disappeared in Timothy Brown. So I think it's safe to say that Timothy was the first case of the 44 million people worldwide living with HIV was the first case of a sterilizing cure. And basically set the stage for this impetus to identify a cure for HIV. And then more recently, Adam Castileo was a patient in an IC STEM cohort run out of Barcelona and uh, out of um, uh, Anne-Marie Vensing's lab um, in, um, in the Netherlands. I'm blacking it on the series right now. And they, the, the, uh, Adam received cord blood transplant uh, cells from an individual that lacked CCR5. A much, a much easier um, transplant regimen compared to, compare to what Timothy Ray Brown went through. And Adam has now been just upwards of four years in remission. Remember back to the Mississippi baby, you know, where it looked like the, the infant was cured, but after four years, the virus rebounded. So this is not, you know, validated yet. Um, and and Adam is still antibody positive. So time will tell whether this is another example of a cure. So these are examples of a cure, but they're not what we call the cure. We obviously can't use bone marrow uh, transplant to eliminate the HIV reservoirs. Um, uh, it can only be done for someone who has lymphoma. Um, you can't increase the risk of the patient. So unless the individual has lymphoma, you can't um, take someone with HIV infection and try to cure it with a, with a transplant. You've got you know, mortality and cost issues all make this um, uh, non-feasible uh, as approach to cure HIV infection. Nevertheless, some of the Delaney collaboratories are taking some of these lessons to try and create safer modalities that can leverage some of these lessons for a more practical and scalable cure. So one of those um, uh, examples in the gene and cell based therapies approach is to use molecular scissors to cut out things from the cell that the virus might need to replicate or to cut out the virus itself. So you're all familiar with, with the uh, revolution in the use of, of molecular enzymes, zinc finger nucleases, CRISPR-Cas, <clears throat> that in a sequence specific manner um, will introduce a double stranded break into DNA. So some groups have been using these molecular scissors to, for example, cut out the CCR5 gene. So uh, artificially creating a situation that's already present in one in 100 Caucasians that don't have a functional CCR5 gene. And the idea is that you manipulate these cells ex vivo, um, you cut out the CCR5 locus, and then you introduce them back into the individual so that now they have CD4 T cells that are resistant to HIV infection. And then the more challenging approach is to get the molecular scissors to cut out the virus itself. So all these viral genomes that are resi residing in cells would then be targeted by these molecular scissors, rendering them non-functional. There are significant obstacles to these approaches. One is delivery. If you remember back to my description of a latently infected cell where there's nothing to distinguish the latently infected cell from an, infected, from an uninfected cell other than the presence of viral DNA. And that makes it challenging to target these molecular scissors using um, uh, um, uh, vectors, retroviral vectors or lentiviral vectors to the infected cell because there's nothing for that vector to specifically recognize an infected cell. So this lack of target mark markers makes it very challenging to specifically seek out and destroy the cells that harbor the latent virus. So, but this is not deterred um, uh, some research groups. And in fact, Excision Biotherapeutics um, uh, had an IND approval for a phase one, two trial of EBT 101, which uses AAB adeno associated virus to target um, guide RNAs to the viral genome to try and render the viral genome inactive. I think it's amazing technology. I just think it's the wrong application for that technology. 
And this slide kind of illustrates that. So imagine, if you will, here is a sea of, of yellow tulips. So these are all CD4 T cells that are not infected. They don't have the HIV genome. In an, an individual living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy, the frequency of latently infected cells is estimated to be anywhere from 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 10,000. So here we have the red tulip in this sea of yellow tulips, and that's the one that harbors the latent HIV. So unless we have a way to specifically seek out that infected cell with, with these vector delivery strategies, the only way to get rid of it is to remove all the yellow tulips at the same time. So clearly, um, there are going to be significant challenges to adopting this approach for HIV cure. <clears throat> and then I mentioned um, because of the characteristics of the lately infected cell, many groups are looking for small molecules that reactivate the lately infected cell, convert it from a cell in which the virus is dormant to one in which the virus is active and replicating, so that it can then be attacked with conventional antiretrovirals or cleared by the immune system. So there is now an armamentarium of small molecules um, encompassing various chemical classes that have been shown in in vitro models to reactivate HIV. So the strategy in these, this tiny diagram at the top is basically to take a latently infected cell on the left, treat it with these chemicals to wake the virus up, the virus now starts to replicate. One of two things might happen. The cell is killed by the replication of the virus because HIV is a cytopathic virus. It kills the host cell when it replicates. Or that cell is recognized by, for example, natural killer cells or CD8 T cells and cleared that way. So this, there's been a number of clinical protocols exploring some of these molecules. The results have been underwhelming to date um, for various reasons. One is that the, no one has really identified a truly potent agent that, that, that triggers reactivation of HIV. And secondly, in most individuals, once the virus is reactivated, the immune system doesn't really do, appear to do much about it. So this is, is starting to fall out of favor um, in the cure field. And then there's doing the opposite. Some scientists have, have reasoned, well, why do we want to try and wake the virus up? What if we could send the virus to sleep into a permanent state of dormancy so that it's there, but it's no longer active? <clears throat> so Susanna Valenti in Scripps, Florida, has coined a strategy called block and lock. And what she has shown is that a small molecule called cortostatin A it blocks the action of one of the virus's transactivator proteins called TAT. When she treats cells from infected individuals with this compound, this, this, the, the virus goes into a state of dormancy that's hard to reverse. So all of those small molecules that, sh that have been shown to reactivate latency don't work on latently infected cells that have been treated with cortostatin A. Now, there's a lot of people like this kind of strategy, me included, because there may be some precedent in individuals who are naturally controlling their HIV infection that might this might be occurring in the normal course of HIV replication. And these are studies in elite controllers. Elite controllers are individuals who have never been on antiretroviral therapy. They have lower levels of virus just based on the frequency of their infected cells but they control something in those individuals is controlling the infection. It's unclear for the, mo for the majority of them what is, what is actually controlling HIV, what is stopping HIV from running amok and destroying CD4 T cells as you would normally see with HIV infection. <clears throat> so Zhu Yu um, and her husband, Matthias Lichterfeld, at the Ragon Institute in, in, in Boston, have been looking at the, the, the sort of the proviral landscape in these individuals, these elite controllers. And what they found is that if you look at the viral gene in individuals who have been infected for 10, 50 years, who have never been on antiretroviral therapy and who are controlling the virus, the virus looks like it's inert. 
the virus is there, but the virus has been painted with epigenetic marks that render that typically render DNA inactive. Those proviruses tend to be found in gene deserts, regions of chromatin in which there's little transcriptional activity. And that's raised the possibility that starving the virus of transcriptional factors may send it into an, a permanent stage or a, a permanent phase of inactivity that explains some of the phenotype of these elite controllers. And uh, Rebecca Peters, a PhD student in my lab, <clears throat> explored this phenomenon in myeloid cells, and she asked if we take myeloid cells that are latently infected and we starve them of some of the transcriptional factors, the one in particular that she was looking at is NF-kappa B, what happens to the virus? So she established a model for, for, for viral latency in macrophages. So um, uh, in these cells that have been um, uh, enter, uh, forced to go into latency, you can take them, there's very little viral activity shown on the left hand side, the first set of, of bars on the left. If you then stimulate them with small molecules that have been shown to reactivate HIV latency, you can see this increase in viral activity. If she starves those cells of NF-kappa B, she doesn't see this reactivation of the virus. So for some reason, limiting the, the, the transcriptional activity of the virus seems to have impaired its function, its competence. <clears throat> so she asked then if it's reversible. We know with most HIV treatment strategies, the effects can be rapidly be reversed when the inhibitor is removed. Surprisingly, when she takes these latently infected cells that have been in, starved of this transcription factor and then removes the small molecules, she doesn't restore the ability of the virus to reactivate. So something has happened to these viral genomes that have rendered them permanently non-functional. Next, I want to cover broadly neutralizing antibodies. It's tempting to think of antibodies in strategies for uh, vaccine development, for HIV prevention, but antibodies are now forming a central part of many groups' um, efforts to cure HIV infection. Now, these broadly neutralizing antibodies that are the center of attention um, in the HIV field exhibit uh, characteristics that are not present in general anti-HIV antibodies. Most HIV antibodies that are generated in an infected individual have very limited neutralization breadth. They may neutralize 20, 25 percent of the viruses that are out there, and they tend to be rather low in potency. These broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been identified in rare individuals, there's probably two dozen now uh, that are out there, neutralize upwards of 95 to 98 percent of the viruses in circulation, and they are incredibly potent. So here is the viral um, uh, envelope with its various domains, the CD4 binding site, the B1V2 loop, uh, epitopes that are exposed by receptor binding, <clears throat> Uh, epitopes that protect the envelope from antibody recognition. So now there are CD4 uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that target most of these regions on the viral envelope glycoprotein. The challenge is how do you take an antibody? Okay, you can, you, obviously people are trying to figure out ways to create these antibodies in a vaccine and uh, heroic efforts in many labs, but no one has figured out a vaccine modality that induces these broadly neutralizing antibodies. They're highly somatically mutated from germline. And it's possible that they never will come up with a regimen that triggers broadly neutralizing antibodies. So instead, um, uh, these antibodies are being synthesized um, and then injected into, in, into individuals to block HIV infection or to prevent HIV infection. Of course, that's a significant undertaking. You know, you're talking about two milligrams of antibody for, you know, a single dose in a 65 kilogram adult. Um, incredibly expensive, difficult to manufacture. So delivery, stability are significant challenges. 
Some of the antibodies have been modified to um, be more stable in body fluids, so their half-life has been increased from a few days to a few months. But still, if we're looking at most infections worldwide occurring in countries that are resource limited, um, it's hard to envision strategies where to prevent or to vaccinate against HIV, we're going to be giving monthly infusions of very expensive antibody. So a central challenge here is to come up with a way to deliver the antibodies in a way that can be sustained long term. Now, in monkeys, some of these antibodies have um, uh, shown rather surprising. This one from Berducci, what they did is they took a, a broadly neutralizing antibody that recognizes uh, SHIV, a virus that can replicate in monkeys. And then they combined it with a compound from Gilead. It's a TLR7 agonist that's supposed to stimulate CD4, uh, CD8 T cell activity. The animals were put on um, antiretrovirals within a week of infection. So this is an example of a very early an antiviral intervention. And then they pulsed these animals with the antibody and with the agonist. And the surprising thing is that half the animals that got through this treatment controlled their HIV infection. And when the antiretroviral regimen was removed, there was no rebound in plasma viremia. It's unclear why these animals are now controlling after being given this antibody and this TLR7 agonist, but this is now entering uh, uh, human studies. <clears throat> and then to address the delivery problem, scientists at the University of Miami, Ron Desrosi, uh, Kima Martinez and, and, and uh, Sebastian Fuchs <clears throat> have taken AAV, adeno-associated virus. They have inserted the antibody genes into the virus. Now, the peculiar thing about AAV, it's a, it's a, a virus that's well known to in the gene therapy field. <clears throat> Basically, um, it has a proven ability to achieve long-term expression. The only thing it's expressed from that recombinant virus is the transgene. It doesn't integrate, well, it doesn't integrate to any uh, significant extent. So there's no opportunity for insertion of mutagenesis or activation of growth factor genes. So what Ron and his team did is they inserted some of these antibodies, injected it into the muscle of macaques, <clears throat> were able to achieve um, significant long-term delivery of the antibody. So here is one example of what happens when you introduce this AAV expressing two antibodies into a monkey that has been infected for several years and never been on antiretroviral therapy. What happens is as soon as the antibody starts getting produced from the muscle cells, because the muscle cell doesn't turn over, so the antibodies are, are produced long term. The viral load dropped to undetectable and remained there. This animal is called the Miami monkey. It wasn't us that coined that name, it was others in the field as in, in deference to the Berlin patient, Timothy Brown. It's the first example of a monkey that has been cured of its infection. And similar to what was observed in Timothy Brown, the antibody levels to the virus, the natural um, uh, uh, host antibodies to the virus have now dwindled to undetectable. There's been no evidence of virus in almost seven years since the AAV was administered. Uh, the viral genomes are undetectable. <clears throat> and even more remarkably, if you take 200 million lymph node cells from these animals and transplant them into naive animal, there is no transfer of the infection. Sounds wonderful, there is one significant obstacle, and that is the anti-drug antibody response. So in most of the monkeys that get these AAV uh, in, uh, injections, the immune system makes antibodies against the broadly neutralizing antibody that's made from AAV. So all efforts are underway to try and figure out how to prevent the antibody from being um, uh, re rejected. And if that problem can be solved, we're talking about a single shot cure for HIV infection. Because this, th there's now four monkeys that have been cured by this approach. This animal has been seven years virus free, <clears throat> um, still eats bananas, still flings poo, is happy. But this is after a single 
intramuscular injection of AAV. So what are the realities for a global cure? The Gates Foundation has come up with what a cure might look like in terms of profile and cost, efficacy um, in the absence of therapy, limited product administration. So giving antibody uh, every month is not going to work. It's going to have to be sustained antibody production. And target populations, uh, effective in our individuals initiated at any stage um, of treatment. And then long-term safety, comparable to ART, to antiretroviral therapy. That's a significant bar to reach because we all know that antiretroviral therapy is incredibly safe, incredibly tolerable. And once we have the long acting formulations, it's going to improve the adherence, hopefully. So for a, an intervention aimed at curing infection to be as safe as this is really going to be a high bar to meet. So thus far, HIV has been cured only under extraordinary circumstances, the London patient, the Berlin patient. So HIV cure as yet remains an aspirational goal. So we need a better understanding of the mechanisms of HIV persistence. We need to know where the virus is coming from so that we can come up with better strategies to target those hidey holes of the virus. And given the safety and antiretroviral therapy and uncertainties regarding the risk of some of these new interventions, block and lock, shock and kill, gene-based therapies, CRISPR-Cas, um, we need to be able to ensure that those interventions adhere to the highest scientific and ethical standards. And of course, because of the safety profiles of antiretroviral therapy, it's going to be very, very tough to come up with a cure protocol that is comparable to that. So I'll finish. For those of you who are interested in the cure for HIV and where the science is at, we have a meeting in Miami every two years. The next one is going to be December 13th to the 16th. <clears throat> the only problem with having a meeting is in Miami is all your your cure collaborators show up with their speedos, um, which is uh, not a pretty sight for most of them. Anyway, I'll finish there and thank you for the attention. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. I, I raise the same issue every time I go to a meeting and I hear um, I was in Barcelona and, and uh, a group was presenting their latest cure protocol that requires multiple infusions with uh, a TLR7 agonist and an antibody, and then shocking the, the reservoirs with a latency reactivator. You know, the, the patient's coming to the clinic every month for eight months. And I said, yeah, but we have long actings. We, you know, this, this is a hard regimen for the patient. They all acknowledge it. Um, if, if we had long acting formulations three years ago, we, we probably wouldn't have a cure research arena. Um, again, you know, individuals living with HIV infection, their perspective is very different. They, they don't want to be, you know, taking even, even an injectable that's going to keep the virus in check. They want to be rid of the virus. They want to be off antiretrovirals. Um, but, you know, we have to be, keep things in perspective. Most of the infections are occurring in countries that spend less than $1,000 per year per individual on healthcare. So if we're going to have a, an intervention that works globally, um, it's going to be have to be very cost effective, very simple to take. And that's why I think the AAV approach, if that obstacle can, can be resolved, is one way, is one realistic goal to um, 
uh, controlling HIV in, in resource-rich resource and resource-limited settings. Would you please repeat the questions each time? Yes, sorry. Thank you. The question is, uh, in, in, in monkeys that have received ant uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, and I guess whether infused or whether using AAV, are there any untoward effects, any uh, collateral damage? Uh, so far, in the monkeys that have been cured in uh, the Miami cohort, um, there's no evidence of any side effects. And these antibodies pretty much dominate the antibody repertoire. 20% um, of the of all that circulating antibody in some of these animals are the anti-HIV antibodies coming from these uh, transduced muscle cells. Um, but there are no um, uh, there's no evidence of any uh, antibody opathies. These animals, um, as I said, they they look happy. They still eat their bananas and they still throw poo around at the visitors. Um, this is Michael Tang. Can, can I follow up on that? The, um, the observation with the anti-drug antibodies yes. that you see in the AAV, are those uh, truly anti-idiotype antibodies or are those maybe due to the it's a human antibody that you put into a monkey? Is it an anti-species uh, antibody anti that you're saying? Yeah, so the question is um, the antibodies that are being delivered by the AAV, are they the human or are they, these are resuscized? Uh, so they're codon optimized for expression in macaques. <clears throat> and even so, we still see this anti-drug antibody response. But again, you know, every, every scientific um, uh, uh, bump in the road is, is, a, is a, an area for investigation. And, and you know, Ron Desrosiers' groups, they've got some smart people there. They'll figure out how to stop the anti-drug antibody response so that every animal that gets this treatment sustains antibody production and achieves a cure. Sorry. Thank you. Question it relates to uh, exploiting innate T cells to control HIV infection, either, either at the port of ent portal of entry or beyond. Um, so the TLR7 agonist that uh, was developed by Gilead was specifically for that. It was to energize CD8 T cells to more effectively recognize and kill infected cells. Um, and then some of the antibodies that we are working with um, are, are being boosted for ADCC activity so as to improve NK recognition and killing. Um, so you can remove um, the FUCO's moiety on an antibody and the, the, the ADCC activity goes up 80 fold. So now you've got broadly neutralizing antibodies that have tremendous potency and breadth and also have ADCC activity. So we'll you know, studies are underway to see if 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 those are uh, effectively controlling not just from a reservoir elimination standpoint, but also from a prevention standpoint. Because if you do this in an uninfected monkey, those antibodies are going to be present to prevent uh, any 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 viral transmission. Sounds good, but I'm sure it's um, not going to be that easy. No more questions. Well, thank you, uh, John. Um, the question is, if I was a betting man, what would I put my money on? 
I would bet the farm on AAV delivery of broadly neutralizing antibodies. Uh, unfortunately, um, the the AAV delivery of antibody hasn't really taken off yet. So, you know, if, 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 if first of all, if I was a betting man, I'd be I'd be saying, you know, I need someone to help me level the the, the betting odds. And the first thing we do is get the NIH to call together a meeting of of immunologists and cell biologists to look at the anti-drug antibody response, because it's not just common to what's happening with AAV. So there was a recent trial, clinical trial, infusing antibody into individuals, broadly neutralizing antibodies into individuals, 10 individuals enrolled, enrolled in the study. And in every one, within a week of antibody infusion, antibody levels dropped to undetectable. And that coincided with an increase in host antibody directed against the infused antibody. Some of the best selling drugs in Humira, 10, 15% of people fail therapy because their immune system makes antibodies against the antibody. So anti-drug antibody is a common problem that needs a concerted effort to figure out uh, how to overcome it, not just for HIV, but for, 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 for other diseases. I would bet the farm on, on uh, a sustainable delivery system like, like AAV um, uh, expressing broad neutralizing antibodies. Um, the question is, um, do I rec recommend a single intervention or there is it likely with, I guess with combination antiretroviral therapy, that we're going to have to use several modalities. Again, we have to look at where most of the infections are occurring worldwide and the resources that are available to combat those infections in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, so if, if we're talking about a realistic strategy, hopefully it would be a single shot. It would be it would be very cheap. It would it would not require follow up visits um, or or um, access to, to, to clinical facilities. So that limits the options. It certainly uh, restricts our ability to use gene therapy approaches or cell mediated approaches like engineered CD8 T cells. Um, so if we're going to get beyond the idea of limiting an HIV cure to you know, rich white folks who can afford to pay $300,000 to be rid of their HIV, if we are really talking about curing for all, um, it's, it's going to have to be very simple. Single shot and you're done. OK, thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks for the